This program does not provide medical advice. We assume no liability for the information provided on MindForce Radio. Please consult your physician before beginning any exercise or nutrition program. This is Roger LaPointe, and I have known Bob Whalen for many years at this point, and he is one of the most intense individuals you will ever meet. Go MindForce Radio. From Mind Force Radio, this is Natural Strength Night with Maximum Bob. On Natural Strength Night, we don't talk about the other things Bob likes to talk about. Tonight, we only talk strength training. When I say strength training, I don't mean training like punk-ass goons in the muscle magazines who jacked up on juice, steroids, and PEDs. I mean natural strength. Strength built on good food, heavy weights, and no shortcuts. If you want to learn about real natural strength, weight training the right way, the old school way, stick around. Bob and his friends just might teach you something. He's here, the host of Natural Strength Night, Maximum Bob Whalen. Tonight, we welcome back Mr. Dick Connor. Dick has been on the show several times. He is always extremely entertaining, and listeners can't seem to get enough of him. Dick has been involved in strength training for over 60 years. He's one of the greatest powerlifting coaches of all time. He has written many great articles for Hard Gainer, NaturalStrength.com, and others. He is a wealth of information, so pay attention. Dick is the founder of The Pit one of the best strength gyms in the country, and he still works there a few days a week. If you live anywhere near Evansville, Indiana, you should go get a workout from Coach Connor. Visit the website, thepitbarbellclub.com. And Dick, welcome back to Natural Strength Night. Okay, Bob, glad to be back. I really appreciate you asking. Now, Dick, for the first question, what type of atmosphere did you find at Leo Stern's gym back in the 1950s? Well, you know, it was a little scary for me. Uh, I'd been lifting weights at that time for a, a, probably a year and a half, and I'd been to the Philippines and lifted at a gym over there that I really liked. But while I was in the Philippines, a guy, I, I, I think I was bugging a guy about how he got the body he had. And he said, when you get back to Dago, San Diego, he says, go see Leo Stern. He'll take care of you. Well, I never heard of Leo Stern, but as soon as I got back, we went, or I went, to uh, Stern's gym, Leo Stern's gym in in San Diego. And I um, went there on a Saturday, and, and went, when I, it was upstairs, and, and so as I was going upstairs, I looked at some big pictures on the wall. One right at the top to the left was a picture of Bill Pearl, almost a life-size picture. And I thought, my goodness, this place is intimidating. And when I get there, it's like a Saturday afternoon, like I said. And it, normal at that time in history, a lot of people didn't train on uh, Saturday afternoon. And so uh, I'm, I'm looking around. The gym was relatively empty. And I seen a guy come down, uh, come down this ladder they had that went up through the roof and this this trap door this thing was permanent in that gym and this guy comes down and it i found out later it was bill golumbic and uh, hmm. he and i'm standing there watching and he he walks over and they had these hand things where you could do handstand push-ups and that guy flipped up on his hands and started doing handstand push-ups like it's easy to do push-ups and i knew i was in a real deal then i knew this had to be a place where uh, the guys who were uh, really into strength training, some place where you could really train and learn something. And, you know, I was impressed by it and so on and so forth. 
What was the core philosophy of the pit and how you built the atmosphere there? The thing that always bothered me when I was training myself, I I wondered continually how much to train, how often to train, how many sets to train, and so on and so forth. So forth. But by the time we got to, to the pit, we had a clue. By the time I opened the place and I started it, you know, uh, and and it grew and 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 so on and so forth. But from the very start, uh, I, I had come to understand, which was years after, say, for instance, Leo Stern's place. I, I had I understood that you didn't need to do set after set, and so the the, the whole idea that I tried to teach people was: it is intensity that counts. You don't need uh, to work out six days a week. You know, of course, we trained a little more then than I would recommend now. But uh, basically, we trained three times a week. That's what we taught. Although now, for years now, I realize that twice a week is all you need. But one set's all I basically ever recommended, unless it was a power lifter who was trying to learn skill. We had to go over and over again uh, technique in the squat and deadlift and bend, so guys could learn the skill of, of of how to handle or how to do those lifts in, in, in the best way possible to demonstrate strength. So basically, my philosophy was if you got to work hard, and if you do, you won't work much. And uh, so by then, we understood what I still believe to this day. I know most people probably still don't believe it. One set's enough. It, I was watching a guy the other day, and I was doing set after set of calf raises, and he, he, you know, I know his calves haven't changed in years, but they want, they think eventually it's going to happen. You just train hard and see what happens, and and um, uh, so th- I had reached that point by the seventies, and you know, going back to Leo, it was back in the fifties. So back then, I believed in lots of sets and so on and so forth, and it all works to some degree, but. My main belief was, and still is, it's work hard. You don't have to work till you pass out kind of an attitude, but you do have to work hard and try to progressively strength train. Have a goal of 12 repetitions or 15 or 8, whatever it is you feel like works the best for you, and find out what works best for you. And control that weight and move it till you can't move it, and then... You've done that set. That that that's. I, I believe that in the seventies, and I still believe it. Basically, that there's no. Uh, you just can't go. You, you know, and you, that's the, what you have to do. You have to learn and understand what working hard is. And I'm telling you, there's a bunch of people who still don't understand it. So, that was our belief back then, and still is. Yeah. What year did you start the pit? Well, I started it uh, in, in, you know, the middle 60s. Uh, it started by accident. Uh, I was training a guy or two. Uh, I was on a police department, and the guy asked me to work with his son. The other guy asked me to work with his son, and pretty soon we made an investment, me and three other guys, and it fell apart with them, and I ended up owning a lot of equipment, and it just evolved from there. I mean, I enjoyed and loved what I was doing, but I knew I didn't have very much sense when it came to business, and I didn't know what to do with it almost uh, on the business side. Uh, I just, because I wanted to train people, realizing that you need help, uh, you know, I, I, you really need help. If I, when I look back, I realize if I'd have just had a good mentor who would have took hold of me by the neck and said, "Look, stupid, I'll show you how to train and I'll make you better. Just listen to me." Uh, you really need a trainer, and, and you need somebody that, that 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 you know that knows this stuff and knows that you know, and not trying to make money off of you necessarily. You know, yes, they're if they're spending their time and working hard with you, they deserve money. But I'm talking about, uh, and it, you know, that y- y- you need help. And I wish I'd have had help. I wish I'd had help back then, even running a gym. Uh, as And then eventually I got a guy, and me and him, and I literally, you know, ba- basically said, give him 50% of it. And he actually ran the gym for years and done a good job. 
while I done what I wanted to do, train people. Now, what, what was your motivation for how you designed the gym? Not, not your training philosophy, but I know the pit right. is very unique, and you've got some great, unique equipment in there. You know, you, you have odd objects and hardcore equipment, and you have stuff that you can't find in any other gym. So, you know, what, what was your motivation or, uh, what, you know, what, what gave you the idea, the way you designed the, the way the pit, the pit is made? I liked powerlifting for some reason. I got involved with it. Uh, so we developed, we, 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 we made sure we had a powerlifting area. You know, we had squat cages, four squat cages, and four bench press uh, benches, and a platform for deadlifts, and just all those kind of things in the rear part of the gym. Because I don't think up front's where you put powerlifters, but we had an area where we had uh, uh, machines of all types, and we would buy machines and get rid of them, and we would keep what we thought worked the best and so on and so forth. Uh, but we spent a lot of money, uh, I mean lots of money, in, in in equipment. We Probably if we really wanted to go big-time business-wise, we needed to invest in a building more. We had a building, but it was not... The, uh, the, the best place uh, as far as the building wasn't the best type building, but we spent uh, we, we spent lots of money on equipment because that was my idea, and I really, uh, you know, I believe that, that it's important to have certain tools. You don't need all the things we had, or, or, or that they even have now. But um, it was, you know, I, I I don't know. I liked equipment. I liked the way it looked, and 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 you know, and then I would use it on people, and I've seen some outstanding pieces of equipment, and I've seen some equipment that wasn't outstanding, but you really don't know till you try it, and I, I'm amazed at what some of these bigger, uh, outstanding looking buildings has inside it. As far as equipment, it's not much, and some of the places I've been around, it's it's all building and shower rooms, and that's all nice. I just think they ought to spend a little more money on good equipment. I don't know if that answers it or not uh, what you asked. Oh, it totally answered it. Thanks a lot, Dick. This is one from your wife, Pat. <laughs> she told me to ask you, what sign did Joe Gold have in his gym that would astonish the modern trainee? <laughs> well, I, I would – I'll give you that answer. I'd just like to say that those guys back then all had a, almost a military attitude about them. Leo Stern and uh, Joe Gold and all them guys that that I run into, uh, they were not. Well, yeah, <laughs> Vince, yeah. Uh, George Turner over in St. Louis. You'd think them guys all come out of the same family. They didn't run a gym. They run a gym like uh, Vince uh, Lombardi did a football team. Yeah, and I know a lot of guys right. don't know what that means, but I mean they did not run a gym. Uh, most of them. Uh, with, uh, you know, the attitude of you are extremely important to us and we hope you come back and we're going to give you the answer you want to hear. What do you want to hear? Their answer was, you know, uh, would be, you know, we're going to tell you. Uh, it's just like Leo Stern told me one time. I said, I don't want to do I asked him to change my, my workout that he made for me and, and, uh, and, and, and I said, I want this on there and not that. And he said, and this is what he said. He said, listen, boy. He said, that is not, I thought it was a chest exercise. He said, that ain't a chest exercise. It's a tricep exercise. Well, I didn't say nothing else to Leo Stern about his workouts. But anyway, Joe Gold's gym, when I went in, it was World Gym by then. He had sold Joe Gold's. And it's a long story how he got back into a business that he had sold uh, himself and then bought it back. But in, in, in World Gym, he had it was a big painted up sign, and I never will forget seeing. I, I never seen anything like it before or since in any gym. He says it said, "If you don't know how to train, go some go somewhere else." Almost to those hmm. exact words. I thought, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and I also asked him. I said, "Can we look at your gym, Joe?" And he says, "Look at it." Because we weren't there to work out, we just looking around, you know, at that particular time. And, and he just hollered, "Look at it!" <laughs> so he was, that, that's the way them guys were. They was a little bit harsh, uh, you know. You'd have to, you'd have to be pretty thick-skinned to be around them. In 1981, 
Because I, I know you're a big fan of gyms. I mean, you, you you collect gyms like some people collect coins. I mean, you like to go to gyms and you just love looking at different gyms. You have one of the best in the country in the pit. I know you told me before that in 1981 that you and three of your friends took a trip across America to see as many gyms as you could. What, well, what impressed you the most on your trip? Well, you know, like what gyms really stood out and what impressed you the most on that trip? <laughs> yeah, that... That was some kind of trip uh, in that these guys worked out, as far as I can remember, um, every day on this trip. Because we had to go visit these places, and then we'd we'd go in, and then they'd more or less, uh, to be invited in, we'd have to train, or they'd have to train. Uh, I wasn't doing no training, but they were training all the time, and... Uh, you know, so we went to a lot of places. Every day we went to different gyms. And um, like I said, we went all the way from, uh, actually, we was at a powerlifting meet up in um, northern Indiana, the state meet. And we left from there and went down to Omaha and on down Vegas and down to San Diego and all the way up to Canada, San Francisco. We went to all these places and looked at gyms. But I remember in Vegas, we went to George Eiferman's gym, and George was uh, uh, um, was a Mr. America, and if you guys ever seen a picture of him, he had the thickest chest muscles in his day. They were he was uniquely built in that respect. Probably a, back then a really a great bencher back in his day. But he, when we went to his gym, unlike the guys I just mentioned, George. Um, was standing at the door like somebody, uh, I guess, at a nightclub or something, or like a preacher, and he was shaking people's hands as they come in and, and introducing himself and talking to you and what you, you know, he uh, spent a little time with everybody. They come in just, you know, glad that they were there. I thought, man, I never seen anything like this, uh, and that's what he done all the time we was there. These guys worked out there, and it was really a well equipped gym. And, and the guys that, that went with me, or I went with them, uh, they all um, they all worked out there, and so on and so forth. And George was there, and he told me about, you know, he was a good friend of um, Steve Reeves, and talked a little bit with him about Steve Reeves. He had a pictures of Steve Reeves outside there, you know, right there where he was greeting people. It's kind of like a foyer there, you know, inside then you inside the gym. But it was unusual. I never seen anything like him. And that, did you ever go to a uh... Vic Tanny's gyms? Yeah, I went to a Vic Tanny for just a few minutes down in San Diego because Vic Tanny owned uh, gyms all up and down the coast. I've heard as many as 90 at one time, and they were that was back in the day when uh, women didn't want to have muscles. Uh, this was in the 50s, and, um, you know, they thought they would get, people thought you would get muscle-bound and, and all those kind of things uh, that were ridiculous when you know about them. But uh, it, they were pink and white and had some red and chrome-plated weights, and they used light weights. And uh, yeah, he was a guy that, you know, they didn't want to use a heavy weight because they didn't want to get muscles, and they wanted it as, as, as and I think it was Arthur Jones that made the statement that Vic Taney was the guy that invented the word toning, uh, which, wow. you know— they would tone up so they wouldn't get muscle bound. You just train with light weights and um, not get stronger and not get big muscles, but just tone. And of course, that's still around today. Uh, <laughs> so that's where it started, Vic Tanny. <laughs> that's the way. I, that's what I understand. But but you know, he had a, he, he did a. I, I would say really got the women started in the gyms. And of course, no, most women back in didn't want to be in a gym with a man. To start off with. A, uh, that's they just didn't think that way, you know. What about Vince Geronda? Yeah, I was up there a couple of times. Um, we went there on our trip, but I was there at another time, and he was a, he, he was of the same character of uh, Joe Gold and uh, George Turner and Leo Stern and those guys. He was he was r a little rough. What did he say uh, you to know, you? Of course. <laughs> well, but well, Vince Garanda's gym was all homemade stuff, and I forget what's the word you use when you make something that's. Uh, let's say you were building a machine, but you made a um, 
and the initial piece of equipment would be a something. I forget what they call it. But anyway, mm-hmm. he, you know. Prototype? Prototype. Yeah, that's what right. the word he used. But, you know, everything in his place was pretty much, I, I never seen anything and I could remember. First of all, it was so little, you wouldn't believe it, as famous as it was. It was really famous and little. And it had a skylight and basically didn't probably use much electricity. And it, that part of California didn't, a pretty, you know, conservative place to, you know, you mm-hmm. wouldn't, um, it didn't take a lot of money to run that place, except probably taxes in that part of the country. But uh, he was something else. Anyway, one of the guys with me said something about, this is all homemade equipment. And he said it in a derogatory way, which he shouldn't have done. I mean, you should have respect for a guy in his place of business. And besides that, some of the greatest bodybuilders of all time trained there. Um, man, he blew up. He didn't like that. He said, this is prototype <laughs> equipment. <laughs> Which I didn't know what prototype <laughs> even meant. But <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't too yeah, happy. Yeah, I, I, I used to read lots of... I, I used to like reading Vince's stuff because he, he, he was strongly opinionated. And I... I respect oh, yeah. people who, yeah. who are opinionated. I, I like that better than being wishy-washy, right? But yeah, v- he... Vince had strong opinions. I mean, I remember he used to write about there was only one way to do dips, and it was with that V-shaped uh, dipping uh, bar. You know, he didn't like the regular dipping bar. He wanted it. Mm-hmm. Remember that V-shape he used? Yeah. And uh, right. he also had uh, – he wasn't really a big believer in squats. He was only uh, – he wanted you to do those hack squats the way he did them. He, he mm-hmm. had a special way of doing almost everything. Yeah, and I know he was very specific on how he wanted you to do things, and he but he was way ahead of his time on nutrition though, because the, the stuff he said about nutrition, most of it turned out to be right. Yeah, he was ahead of his time. There's no doubt about that. Um, he, you know, but he he was influenced, I'm sure. But and of course, he had an outstanding physique. A guy told me in Salt Lake, I was in a gym in Salt Lake one time, and that was at another time in my life. But the the guy said it. He was at the Mr. USA contest. You had Leo, uh, uh, not Leo, you had um, the guy that used to, Leo Stern used to train. Uh, anyway, there, there was some, no, not Bill Pearl. Um, he used to, before Bill Pearl, he trained with, and I, he, he was called the king of bodybuilders in his day, and he was a, really well built in his time. But anyway, uh, th- th- there were some really outstanding competitors in the Mr. USA. And Vince Garana didn't win the contest, but the guy told me all he did, at least this is the way I understood it, he just stepped on the stage and put his hands together and pressed, you know, flexed his muscles as he pressed against his hands. And he said he just stood there, and he said he just kept getting more defined right in front of you. He said blood vessels <laughs> sticking out. And he said he had the crowd on his feet, you know, from that just that one pose. But, you know, that's what he, you know, he was into muscle shape and vascularity and that sort of thing. Uh, really big. Uh, you know, he, he he believed you could really work, you know, the shape of a muscle and change it. And you can to some degree, you know. But uh, that wasn't Clancy Ross, was it? Yeah, there you go. Clancy Ross was in the contest. I'm trying to say how, you know, it was a really, I think John Grimmick might have been in it. Um, wow. I think Grimmick won it. I think that's a Mr. USA wow. when Grimmick won it, and uh, Clancy Ross was in it, and Vince Garano was in it. Uh, wow. But anyway, that's what that guy told me. I mean, I don't know if it's anything true or not. I just know that uh, he didn't have any reason for telling me anything else. I don't know how we ever got on the subject, the subject of him anyway, but, uh, uh, you know, of Vince Garano. But we did talk about him out there in Salt Lake at this guy's gym. And I can't remember him, nothing about him. He said he was a stud himself, but... Uh, yeah, Vince Garanda, you know, he had his ways, but, I, you know, I, that, that them guys are, you know, worth reading. Uh, they're a part of history, you know, in the way you are about the history of this thing and the way you love it, and I do too. Uh, you know, I, I, I not only respected the guys, I liked them. I really liked them as people, mm-hmm. you know, because they were into something that most people nowadays wouldn't appreciate. It was... You know, and it, it wasn't the, the, the you know, and, and of course, he also, Vince Grant also trained numerous movie stars. Right. Yeah. You know, Clint Eastwood, I think Clint Eastwood probably trained there some. I know that one guy that played in that movie with him the, when he was a fighter looking for the 
fighters. He, the guy that, um, the last guy that he fought in that one movie, ever which way but loose or whatever the name of it was, he mm-hmm. was a Vince Garanda guy. And uh, wow! In your long career, have you ever met uh, Jack Lalane? No, uh, I, I never met Jack Lalane, and I regret not doing something one time. Which I might, it's hard telling who I would have met. I was in the, um, and you can stop me here if I'm getting off silly, but I'm coming right back. Uh, I, I was in the YMCA in, in Los Angeles in 1957, working out, getting ready to go to the Marshall Islands, Kwajalein, and I had taken a, uh, a leave, and I was, uh, as you know, I was in the Navy and the Army, but uh, I had taken a leave, and I was um, uh, up there working out in the YMCA, and this guy says, after I was working out, he says, won't you come down to Muscle Beach with me tomorrow? And, I, you know, I, I didn't trust people too much. And so I, I, he, he was going to take me down there. And I regret to this day that I never went down to Muscle Beach. You know, I went by there 50 times and never went down to Muscle Beach. Now, I'm talking about when it was really Muscle Beach, you know. And, of course, they brought it back. I don't know if it's still around. I think it is now again. Last time I was out in California, we went uh, to that area, and they had it kind of fixed up. But back then, you know, it was like gymnasts and everybody. But I would have probably seen uh, numerous people that were in uh, the magazines and stuff, and I just didn't go down there, but so much for that. We'll be back with more right after this. This segment brought to you by VitalNutritionStore.com. Did you know that more than 7 million Americans suffer from coronary heart disease, the most common form of heart disease? Regardless of your age or condition, adding Cardio for Life to your daily regime will dramatically improve your cardiovascular condition. Cardio for Life has been the top-selling Enlarger 9 product in the marketplace now for more than three years. It is also the top-selling product at VitalNutritionStore.com. Formulated by Dr. Harry Elwart, the best-selling author of Let's Stop the Number One Killer of Americans Today, Dr. Harry believes together we can prevent and reverse heart disease. Cardio for Life comes in three wonderful flavors, orange, peach, and grape, and is gluten-free, sugar-free, and sodium-free. Please see our complete line of natural products at vitalnutritionstore.com. That's V-I-T-A-L nutritionstore.com. Randy Roach shocked the world with the release of his first volume of Muscle Smoke and Mirrors several years ago. It was a masterpiece of over 500 pages with such in-depth research and detail that it was not only surprising, but shocking and mind-blowing. It was truly one of the best Iron Game history books ever written. He followed that with Volume 2, another epic book with over 700 pages of equal depth and detail. All serious Iron Game fans need to have these books. Please visit Randy's website at randyroach.ca. That's R-A-N-D-Y-R-O-A-C-H dot C-A. Listen to how Iron Game legend and the Iron Master editor, Osmo Kihaw, describes the book Supernatural Strength. Have you ever wondered how much real-world experience authors have when they write books about weight training? Who is that person behind the computer? What do they really know about the Iron Game? If you picked up this book, Supernatural Strength, you have definitely come to the right place. The author, Bob Whalen, has spent several decades in the Iron Game trenches training himself, competing and coaching in powerlifting, earning academic credentials too numerous to mention, and thousands of hours of training and instructing athletes and trainees of all levels at his Washington, D.C. gym since 1990. He's not only devoted his life to motivating and pushing people to heights they have never been to, but elevating the trainees' understanding why certain methods work better than others. Bob is one of the most respected and revered trainers in the business today. This book is sure to surprise and amaze you at the same time. Order now at SupernaturalStrength.com. That's SupernaturalStrength.com. Don't you think it would be so much easier getting into shape if you had a personal coach? Just like all the celebrities do. Well, now you can. Bob Whalen of WebStrengthCoach.com wants to get you out of your rut and coach you to success. He's dedicated to helping you achieve your strength and fitness goals through your hard work and his expert guidance. Bob will help you with strength training, muscle building, fitness, nutrition, and motivation. He'll make sure you achieve your maximum physical potential. You can get one-on-one training with Bob through his 
website, webstrengthcoach.com. He will develop a personalized program tailored to your individual needs, a program right for you. Bob will give you feedback after every workout. This is old school fitness and nutrition, no fads and no gimmicks. Bob will use proven natural techniques to make sure you are satisfied. So visit webstrengthcoach.com today and let Bob help you reach your best self. Webstrengthcoach.com Do you enjoy history without social engineering? Reading about our founding fathers? Economics from a capitalist perspective? Wisdom from modern patriots? Welcome to UncleSamBooks.com where virtues like rugged individualism, hard work, and the American dream dominate. UncleSamBooks.com Great books for homeschooling. UncleSamBooks.com If you want to become as strong and muscular as possible with health in mind and without lowering yourself to using steroids, the best advice can be found in the classic strongman books of long ago. These are the best books ever written on the subjects of strength training, weightlifting, strongman training, iron game history, and old-time physical culture. Many of them can still be found at physicalculturebooks.com. There you will find good, honest, time-tested wisdom from the great old-time strongmen to maximize your natural muscular and strength potential. Please visit physicalculturebooks.com. Listen to Ken Manny, head strength and conditioning coach at Michigan State University, describe the book Iron Nation, a masterpiece text on some of the most intriguing and compelling personal stories, iron game history, and gut-wrenching training routines ever put to paper. If you truly love hard training without all the frills of pomp and circumstance so common today, you will love Iron Nation. Written by lifters for lifters. If you love weight training, you will love Iron Nation. Order now at ironnation.com. That's I R O N nation.com. If you would like to promote your business on Mindforce Radio, we would love to hear from you. Please let us know if you are interested in a 30 or 60 second voice commercial or a banner website ad. Please contact Bob using the contact information provided on mindforceradio.com. You're listening to Natural Strength Night on Mind Force Radio. Yeah, could you share with us that funny story you've told me before off the air, right? Your friend Keith Parrish, who I met at one of my clinics, he came with you. And uh, <laughs> you told me this funny story that on that same trip you just told us about when you when you went with your your friends, and he was one of them, right? And you told yeah. me this funny story how he wanted to climb this mountain and he got stuck on the mountaintop <laughs> or something, but it was really funny the way you told it. So tell us well, about he, that, Dick. Yeah, uh, Keith is uh, a, he's a tremendous guy. He's a great character, and he's a super impulsive. You know, I joined the uh, Army on a bet. I was out of, just got out of the Navy, been out a few weeks, and I was training up at Bill Pearls, joined for a year. And one night, me and the guys was out messing around, and I... I said I was going to join the Army. I was going to be a paratrooper. And the guy said, no, you're not. I said, I bet I am. Well, maybe I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't got so far into conversation. But Parrish was worse than me. He was super impulsive. He just jumped in the middle of anything. And anyway, we're out there somewhere in no man's land. And we're, this high cliff along the road, we want to stop and take pictures of it and everything. And Keith starts climbing the thing. And literally, he gets <laughs> way up this thing and couldn't get down. But I never added this to the story. We finally got him down, not by working at it, but by talking to him and everything. Else. I was a nervous wreck. But in San Francisco, down on that uh, bay down there, they have a, a kind of, or they did have, and I'm sure they still do, uh, kind of a museum. And they had just one ship uh, that, you know, sail ship, you know, like an old ship. It was sails and high 
he climbs up one of them, whatever you call them, he's way up the top, and the, the people that run that thing, you know, boy, they had a fit hollering at him. And he climbed right up that thing right there, you know, and so that so didn't he, he would just he just impulsively jump into things. <laughs> it's a wonder we didn't lose him. <laughs> But, you know, the gym's full of, you know, that's another thing that you used to have in gyms. Guys that belonged to gyms back in those days were more characters because, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a an atmosphere that attracted those guys. Nowadays, it's more acceptable, and it's, it's, it's the end thing. You know, there's so many uh, fitness centers nowadays, I can't even count them all in this town I live in. And everybody's mm-hmm. involved in some way, it seems like. But back then, you really had some characters. Yeah, Dick, I know that um, you're well-known for training powerlifters, and uh, you've had a lot of championship powerlifting teams, but you also have trained some bodybuilders, too. What are some of the main differences in how you train the bodybuilders versus how you train your, your powerlifters? You know, I think everybody would be... Uh, 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 c- c- should be considered, you, you know, you're really building your body, but bodybuilders in your terminology, you know, you're speaking of of guys who compete. And now, uh, j- uh, nowadays, it's even different. A guy told me the other day who competed in a, some kind of a bodybuilding thing, uh, really a well-built man. He trains people there to pit. Black kid, nice-looking guy, really well-built. He told me that he competed in a different type bodybuilding and that they come out and go down a thing just like a model does uh, down a mm-hmm. you know this this thing and then they give hit different poses as they go and go back and I thought I never heard anything like that. But getting back to your question, uh, if if a person's going to thinks they're going to compete and the trouble with bodybuilding, uh, in my opinion, and powerlifting too, is the drugs have really <laughs> messed it up. They've messed it up bad, and so. Uh, that what this guy was telling me about this uh, guy there at the pit, uh, he, he was telling me about this thing he was in, and he said you, that you can't be all that big. They are not a, that, that won't be acceptable. So that's probably a good thing, in that you know the, taking the drugs is not going to help you. But everybody's a bodybuilder in a sense. But the competitive bodybuilders I trained. Um, I, I've tried to encourage them to understand you don't have to spend all day on one area of the body, and you're not going to be able to because you're not going to recover. And you do need to train more directly. For instance, you should do calf raise. You should do a leg curl. And, you know, you, you should do uh, uh, some things. For instance, Arthur Jones made the statement, you know, a squat is basically going to develop the thigh, but it won't be quite as good looking a thigh as one that does a squat and a leg extension. And I think that's true because I've had guys that push me to understand that with their own self. In other words, you add a little bit to it. Now, you got to stay within your ability to recover. So bodybuilders need to pick out, you know, in my opinion, there's somewhere uh, – between eight and twelve exercises that you'd have to do that are, you know, hitting ever a body part or almost directly. Now you can't do that with that few exercises, but you can come close. And you're not going to be recovering if you go beyond that, and 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 are training hard. You got to train hard. You got to train those movements that count the most. But you're still going to have to do more in the powerlifter. Powerlifters are going to key in on their favorite lifts um, the, the squat bench and deadlift that's their favorite lifts that's the ones they're going to try to demonstrate and show people how strong they are and they got to work on those three movements and a few assistance exercises you got to have them you got to do some kind of assistance exercise uh for the low back and uh the abdominals and and and, and the shoulders in my opinion uh, you're going to have to do that for powerlifting, but it's different than bodybuilding. And almost anybody I would put in the same category as everybody's a bodybuilder. If they're healthy and they'll work out about twice a week and do no, somewhere between 8 and 12 exercises, um, th- th- then they're a bodybuilder. And then if you get people telling you, man, you look good enough to be in a contest, 
then you might want to do it. But until you do, don't be stupid. I've seen some guys get on stage that did not belong there. They didn't. Somebody needs to tell you, you know, hey, man, you're going to look funny up there. But... <laughs> 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 so, Dick, we have time for one more. Fill everybody in about the new pit. Well, um, the, the owner now, um, Pat Tiring, who, you know, is well-versed in strength training. He's been a powerlifter for years, and uh, he's a tough-minded guy, great personality. Uh, you can't keep from loving him. He's a... Uh, he, he loves he loves the game, and he's really went out on. Um, he, he's taking a big chance uh, in that he's putting together what I think is going to be one of the most unique gems in America. And again, you talked about Zuvers uh, earlier. Sometime me and you have, and the, what kind of place that was. And uh, he's got, he's putting together a place that's going to have anything you want, but it's not going to be. Like I walk in some of these places, I mean they got fantastic buildings, and they just they got cheap equipment and they got very little of it, but they're still making it. Don't get me wrong because of the building and so on. he's going to have an outstanding building, but it's not going to be of the type that I've seen uh, of late, but it's 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 it's, it's it, they're, they're painting it the color of the Marine Corps uh in McDonald's and that it's going to be. Uh, yellow and red all over. They're going to. They got a sign out front, as I understand. It's going to be. You can. It, you know. They can. If you break a record in the gym, it can be put on that sign out there, some way with a computer. You know. And again, I don't want to get out of hand. Right on the highway, right? You said a, a highway yeah, goes by. Yeah, it. on the highway, you'll see this sign. Um, uh, you know, and they're going to have a, a degree of wallpaper of old pictures of the pit to have. I, I'd call it wallpaper, but it's a border. You know what I mean? Up so high. Mm-hmm. Let's go all the way around right. that gym. You got this big border of pictures of uh, they, they, the of, of weightlifters that's been, uh, you know, there over the years. Guys that have trained there, and he, he spent a ton of money on equipment. Um, uh, just it's just you know it's going to be really equipped. I give you an example: a high school here in town. Built a new high school, and they bought. Up, they built. They got this fitness place or this strength training place for their athletes. I talked to a guy about what they put in there, and he says, he says, they, he says they weren't interested in how good equipment is. They wanted a certain color, and I thought, my <laughs> goodness. But I mean, he, he, you know, Pat Tyne's got a history. He's been around this weightlifting for years. He loves it, and he's putting together a, 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 a just a really. Well, it's going to be like a Navy SEAL. It's going to have the equipment. It's going to have that kind of atmosphere. It's not going to be just a big, fantastic building and and just cardio stuff and that sort of thing. But it's a place where a strong man can train. I mean, he he's went, you know, went Louis Simmons's equipment. He's bought everything that will please everybody in equipment. He's really went out on the the limb, and I just hope people understand what he's offering here in Evansville equipment wise nothing around here is going to come close to it or anywhere else I've ever been now I'm sure they is might go out be, there somewhere is the new pit going to be uh near the same location as the old pit well it's I I timed it one time but you know I'm a, I was an ex cop so I could go a little faster I think you know what I mean <laughs> and right. I went over and it took me 10 minutes so the average guy 12 or 15 minutes from there. But it's a four times as big. It's bigger. It's going to have yeah. to be bigger because it's got so much equipment. It's going to, it's just, I mean, he's got, he's got, you know, top of the line of, of everybody's, you know, um, lots of medics equipment. Louis Simmons, you don't put them in the same gym. You know that. Uh, even super right. slow equipment. I mean, he got all kind of stuff that's going to be in this place for, but, you know, if you're a if you're a pilot or a strongman competitor, you got you're gonna have a unique place to train. Now they don't want those guys at these other places. I know how they think. They're gonna have it all under the same roof and these guys will have their area and it's gonna be a big area. When does the new one open up, Dick? Well, it's supposed to open up 
I think in October or November. Um, I don't really know. But they're going to have a powerlifting meet right off. That's another thing. They will have, on a regular basis, uh, powerlifting and and all kind of strength uh, contests there, you know. And it's, there's, there's an area in the place that will be just for that type of stuff where they can compete, like hold a Mr., uh, you know, like a powerlifting state championship, Indiana state championship, and stuff like that. That's the hard part about running a contest is setting one up, and they'll, they will be able to do that without even blinking an eye almost. So uh, it's it's going to be unique. And, Dick, you still go to the pit. You still work there part-time, right? Yeah, I train people a couple of days a week. On um, Wednesday, I go down, I spend a, six or seven hours, and then I go down on Friday and spend six or seven hours. I you, you don't go down until around noon, and then I stay till. And I still train a few power lifters and other people, you know, who just want to train. Uh, I, I still train them. Well, Dick, I just want to thank you for being on the show. It's uh, It was great to have you back, and you're always a wealth of good, solid information. Thanks again, Dick, for being on the show. Okay, Bob. It's great to be there. Coming up next, I have a special treat for you. I found some old Jack LaLanne shows from the early 1960s. Here is just a few minutes of the great Jack LaLanne when he was a young man. Many of you only know Jack as a guy in his 90s selling juicers. Not me. I grew up watching Jack when he was in his prime. The man was way ahead of his time and a genius. Listen to his wisdom from a half century ago and enjoy. I want to tell you about a little something that happened to me this weekend. You know, especially being Monday... We all need little inspirational stories, something to keep us going. I know I do, and I'm sure that you're like I am. You do. And, and another thing, we all have our little problems. Or else we think that uh, the problems that we have are great big things. Maybe they're just little nothings, but they seem like mountains, these molehills, huh? Well, I was visiting with a friend of mine, a man whom I've known for quite a few years. I first met him. He came to me, and he was such in such horrible condition, I just can't tell you. He was so many pounds overweight and he was flabby and he had been jumping from doctor to doctor he'd been spending hundreds of dollars on doctor bills you know and the doctor said well there's nothing really wrong with you but he just thought there was something wrong well he came to me and I saw right away that he wasn't getting any exercise and he wasn't eating properly so I put him on a good program of nutrition and good exercise in just a few weeks time and he was like a different person and he turned out to be a wonderful student of mine up to this time he wasn't too successful as a businessman because he was sick and tired when you're sick and tired it's not conducive to being a success in any field well, he started in business and he made a fabulous success in just a few years. He accumulated over a million dollars. Well, things went bad for him all of a sudden. His investments that he made went sour on him and he lost practically all of his life savings. And he was hopelessly in debt. He couldn't borrow any more money. So right away he started feeling sorry for himself. He had this problem, you know, of no money and he was, uh, you know, owing all these bills. So he just started going back in his old eating habits the way he did many years before and he quit exercising his body, started to get flabby and soft again and he started to get these aches and pains and he was a mess. So one day he looked at himself in the mirror. He got up in the morning, he was feeling terrible. He was feeling like ending it all. He looked in the mirror and he says, you're so stupid. Here, he had quit all of these things. So who, who was he hurting? He was just hurting himself. So right that day, he came down to me again and we put him on the program of nutrition again, got him exercising. So what happened? He started getting that old wonderful self-confident feeling again and he went back into business and everything is going perfect for him now. He still has debts and he still has that problem, but like he told me, he says, Jack, you know, what a fool I was. I still have the problem, but isn't it smarter to be happy with the problem than to be miserable with it? We all, I have problems, you have problems, but why stop our living just because we have these problems? His quit taking care of his body wasn't going to solve this problem, but now that he's taken care of his body, he has a ten times more energy and pep and vitality. He's starting to make a big success. In a few months now, you watch and see, this man will be completely out of the hole. And it's just like a lot of you students out there, you know, because you have your problems and because you have these things, you just kind of stop and you magnify them and you're miserable just for this one problem. Be happy, enjoy with what you have, and improve this body that the good Lord has given you. Let's do it together. I'm going to help you. You kind of help yourself. All right? Come on. No, no problem is going to be too big for us because we're going to smash them. Don't be a flamingo. You have to do your squat. Don't be a flamingo. Real lifters work their legs.
Hi, Bob. My name is Todd. Thanks for having me on the show. I wanted to relate a story. I was working out with my son, who's in the Marines at a large chain gym when he was home on leave. We went ahead and spent some time there. Gym was was well populated. A number of big guys, 400-pound bench presses, full sleeve tattoos, and they were overall fairly polite. But nobody was training hard, out of breath, dripping with sweat, and the squat racks for the entire time we were there were unoccupied. The leg press was being used a bit, but no squat racks. Uh, by contrast, my son and I, where he was kind enough to fly me down to his base, where he snuck in a workout at the base gym. Uh, at the base gym there, a lot smaller gym than the big gym, but the 45 minutes we were there, the squat rack was continually occupied. It was never open. There was a steady stream of young, motivated, shaved heads went in there to try their metal against the squat rack. And uh, so I thought you might enjoy that contrast and how our military is doing these days. Thank you again. In a nutshell, I can give you more good information in a few minutes or so than most books give you. One, always train your whole body, and that means legs. Two, stop reading the mainstream muscle and fiction magazine crap, the good stuff to read, naturalstrength.com, cyberpump.com, hardgainer.com, and anything by Stewart, brookscubic.com, and anything by Brooks, and anything by Dr. Ken. Three, don't waste money on performance supplements. Focus on eating better food. You can't out-exercise a bad diet. Get Bill Pache's ebook, How to Transform Your Physique. Four, the Max Bob 123 is one, mental focus. Two, good form, and three, poundage progression. Not just progression, poundage progression. Going to failure is secondary to poundage progression if you want to build strength. Five, get at least three or four days of recovery between whole body workouts. Six, remember the spiritual and mental parts of your health. They are even more important than the physical part. Start saying your prayers on your knees, too. It might be a good idea to start replacing the word God with Jesus. Seven, don't be another anti-steroid hypocrite. The world is filled with them. If you are against PEDs, then remove pictures of known drug users from your website and take their pictures off the walls of your gym. Eight, Enjoy the journey. Stay positive. Train hard and never give up. Don't be a flamingo. You have to do your squat. Don't be a flamingo. Real lifters work their legs. That's going to do it for this edition of Natural Strength Night on MindForceRadio.com. Please bookmark that website, MindForceRadio.com. Bob is always looking for new writers for NaturalStrength.com who are old school, hardcore, write with passion, and have a strong anti-steroid stance. He also wants your training questions so they can be answered on the show. Please send your articles and training questions to Bob at MindForceRadio.com at earthlink.net. Thanks for listening. See you next time.